Mr. President commenced the meeting in his opening remarks. He, he spoke about his sadness in respect of the recent developments in the country, the recent security challenges we've had, in particular the incident in which several Nigerians lost their lives and many more had been taken into captivity by criminals and bandits. Mr. President has directed all the operational and intelligence elements to rescue these innocent people immediately and unhurt. This is the basis on which other issues were discussed. Obviously, the service chiefs, the chief of defense staff and the service chiefs, as well as the inspector general of police, all briefed the president on the occurrences in their respective organizations. I submitted a memo to council and my recommendations are being looked into by the president. My recommendations are wide ranging and they touch on all aspects of security, starting with the level of security of our land borders as well as within the country itself. In terms of securing the nation, we've recorded a lot of successes in the maritime domain. <clears throat> and obviously the problem now has shifted to our borders from outside. As a result of that, there's a need for us to configure how we're going to make our borders more secure because of the threats coming from outside the borders. Now, the issue in the Northeast, there's been a lot of improvement, and that has been uh, attested to by the governor of Borno State during our last national Council of State meeting. But nevertheless, the fact that the Northeast is becoming much more stable, more and more people from the terrorists have started surrendering to government has not really brought to an end the way we would want the situation in the country because the threat has now shifted from the northeast to the northwest and to the north central and this threat has to be contained. It has to be contained collectively by both the armed forces as well as the constabulary forces, the Nigerian police force, the civil defense, but the intelligence agencies also have been directed to enhance the acquisition of intelligence The present situation in the country calls for collective effort by all, not just those that have been charged with the responsibility of physically securing the country. The most important thing for now is acquisition of intelligence. And the type of intelligence that is needed is human intelligence. And I need to make it very, very clear. I have to be very honest. Unless the wider society, right down to the local governments, are willing to give the type of information that is needed to block the activities of these criminals, this situation will continue to linger beyond what 
whatever time frame we're looking at towards ending this great problem. A lot of lives are being lost. The president is not, he's not happy about this situation. He's made it very, very clear. The first assignment he's given to the security agencies, especially the armed forces and the police, is to rescue those that are in captivity. Not just those that have been captured, but uh, the, that were captured during the last train incident, but those that have been in captivity in other parts of the country. That is the first thing that has to be done. On the other hand, my memo dwelt on the prevailing situation within the security outfits, their needs, their challenges, and the president has decided to look into these things and he might as well uh, <clears throat> call for another meeting in the near future. Thank you very much. The first question has to do with why is it difficult to deploy technology? One, technology is expensive. Technology, it takes time to acquire these things since inherently we do not produce these very, very delicate um, equipment. It's not as if the government is not making any effort to acquire, but you need to know who to acquire this uh, technology from, where, when. Uh, there are certain processes. For now, I know we have, but the, the, the fact is that they're inadequate. So the government, it's a continuous process. That's what I can say about um, the issue of deploying technology. Now, um, for policing, I think I'll leave it to the IG to talk about the insufficient number of um, personnel. For the question on border secu security, obviously we have very extensive borders, and I'm not going to deceive anyone. All of us know that we have problems of um, infiltration by virtue of the fact that we have a very large economy. It attracts a lot of people from outside and they come in illegally, not just through the land borders but also through the maritime borders. Of course, in the case of the maritime borders, a lot of things have been done in the last one year to secure the maritime domain up to the point that the International Maritime Bureau has acknowledged the fact that in 27 years, our maritime borders have not been as secure and peaceful as they were in the last one year. That is a fact, it's not a conjecture. I didn't cook up this thing. So we want to see how we can replicate that type of um, effort we put in the maritime domain on our land borders. That is something that um, council is looking into. Um, intelligence. When I talk about intelligence from the local community, intelligence, I'm talking about complementarity. There are too many types of intelligence, but the most immediate intelligence that you require is human intelligence. And that human intelligence comes from the local communities. The local communities have to find a way of sending whatever information to their leaders, their community leaders or whoever, and that information is to be passed to the agents of state within that locality. And that intelligence is converted into actionable information which the security agencies will work on. It is because of the nature of intelligence. Intelligence has a very, very short shelf life. 
if something happens and you do not deliver it to the right person, perhaps you've been giving your intelligence to the wrong people and that is why it is compromised. You must be able to seek out the right agents of government to give them that intelligence and they can pass it on to the next layer. And that is how they can use other elements to deal with whatever problem that exists. So that is what I mean by getting intelligence from the local community. It's not something that is compelling. It's we have to look after each other's interests. You have to be your brother's keeper because the troops we have, the policemen we have, are not everywhere at the same time. That type of ubiquity is not possible for us. So we need to rely on human intelligence, which is the most accurate. But if you are averse, if you are inhibited, then it makes it difficult for all of us. So that is what I mean by that. Well, someone also said that I'm always saying the president is not happy. The president, is, How can the president be happy in a situation when people are dying? He can never be happy. If 10 times something happens, 10 times he'll be unhappy. And he has to, as the leader of this country, the father of the nation, he has to express his displeasure. You know, he is just at the managerial level. He gives out the instructions, you know, and his displeasure is probably because he feels enough is not being done. So we can't put this thing on his shoulders completely. He's at the strategic level, he takes his decisions. But when these things become endless, he has to express concern, and that is what he did. Let me answer Bolaji's question with respect to the order given by the president to rescue hostages. The Kaduna train incident was like the last straw breaking the camel's back. The president is using that as a reference point to let the security agencies know that they have an obligation to get everybody, every innocent soul that is in captivity out of captivity. It's not particular just about the Kaduna incident, but about all other incidents. Now, the way and manner in which they will be rescued is beyond me. It's not something I'm willing to disclose because that in itself can become a springboard for compromising whatever effort will be put into. I have to be very, very honest with you. That is one. Now, the... The thing I said about local intelligence is that local intelligence complements other forms of intelligence, whether it's signal intelligence, technical intelligence, measurements, and whatever. But you see, it has to be complemented. Whatever intelligence the intelligence agencies have is usually an expansion of local intelligence. That local intelligence is very, very critical. And I know a lot of people are suspicious. A lot of people are averse. <clears throat> Moreover, a lot of people want to hide their own. Regardless of what your own is doing, you feel the need, whether it's maternal, paternal, whatever, you have that need. It's a psychological thing that we have to break away from. You see someone who is inherently toxic and you want to hide him. You are not just doing your community but the entire nation a disservice. This is what I mean by local intelligence. You have to bite the bullet. You have to make up your mind. As painful as it is, you must give away that person. Whether he's addicted to drugs whether he's helping people to bring in small arms and light weapons illegally, whether he's colluding with bandits, whether he has 500 SIM cards in his pocket, which is giving criminals, once you know, 
and you identify. That is what we mean by local intelligence, human intelligence. On the other hand, again, if there's a suspicion between the local community and the agents of government, it is not helpful. It is natural in our type of society because we don't expect everybody to operate on the straight and narrow. You have elements in uniform who can be rogue elements. Out of 200 people, you could have a handful that are operating at cross purposes, outside the confines of legitimacy or legality. So the problem here is that we have to weigh all these issues. And it can make the local community uncomfortable. I admit that you are perfectly right that if you have a perception that there are bad elements and those bad elements, you report them to the local commanders and the local commanders, for whatever reason, they are reluctant to deal with those people, then it exacerbates, it exacerbates an already delicate situation and you will be reluctant to lose your life or to allow harm to come to you. I understand that and that is something we've been going over day in and day out with the intelligence and security agencies. It's a genuine concern. I agree with you absolutely. And that, once you have a situation like that and you alienate the local community, they are not comfortable with you, then there's a big problem. So that's what I mean by human intelligence. Human intelligence does not just involve the person who wants to inflict pain or harm on the community, but it also involves the agent of government who is acting at cross purposes. So you have to find a way. You must seek out someone who is ready to help and give him that information. Um, Governor Nasser El Rufai spoke about um, the security agencies saying we know who they are, where they are. And again, that is the danger when you start talking too much. You give away a lot. I agree. Now, even if they say we know where they are, that in itself is already a problem. Because once you say it, whether it is true or false, the person who has your people in captivity will move to another location. It's just as simple as that. So sometimes it's best to just keep silent. Mum is the word. Um, the, the question on 2023 elections, I'll leave it to the expert, the Inspector General of Police. My sister from Channel said something about, um, I think I answered your question. Someone spoke about, okay, the US government. The president directed the chief of staff and myself to go to Washington and speak with the relevant authorities and try to explain to them and diffuse whatever tension that exists because of some of the things that have gone out from our own people. And as a result of whatever messages that have been sent across to the United States, we've had difficulties in working with them. They've been our allies, of course, naturally they've been our allies. So we had to make a case on behalf of the government and people of Nigeria to set the record straight. And that resulted in um, the offer they made to give us the equipment because they were concerned about certain issues. So the president directed the chief of staff and myself who went to Washington and we spoke with members of Congress, members in, in, in other departments. So that's what gave uh, uh, rise to this thing. So when I ask you to expand mining, it's just throwing the glass. Well, it's just, this is an initial statement that was given. It's 
the ball is in their court, they will be the ones to let us know. These are things that will have to be manufactured. You don't get them off the shelf, you know, but the commitment is already there. There's an understanding. Um, someone spoke about the oil sector. I spoke about the improvement in the maritime domain. This thing is in, you know, in two compartments. I'm talking about the threats on the high seas, piracy and sea robbery. I'm not talking about, I'm talking about the blue waters. I'm not talking about the brown waters where we have the oil spillage, the bunkering and other things. That is a different aspect. I'm talking about the broader Gulf of Guinea situation in which the Nigerian Navy in the last one year has been able to work on um, the, the, the security situation in the maritime domain. And that is what will lead to us trying to see what we can do with the land domain. You are right about the oil production and other things. That's a different issue which is being worked on in conjunction with the management of the NNPC as well as the security agencies. They're well aware of that and something is being done. It's just that I don't think it's necessary for me to go into details here. So maybe the Inspector General of Police will answer the question on the uh, forthcoming elections.